Welcome to Learning Photography with Duck. Here's your host, Duck. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to another edition of Learn Photography with Duck. I am your host, Duck, and uh, I see that we have a couple of new faces in our group today, so I want to uh, thank you very much for being here, Jill and Pam. Um, I, I take it you're both local photographers. I know I had a chance to talk previously just before starting with Jill. She's local, and I guess, Pam, you're local too? Uh, I'm in New York. Actually. Oh, New York. That's local enough. That's local yeah. <laughs> enough. Uh, Lehia is probably our furthest away uh, down in, what, well, Kentucky, right? I'm in South. I'm going to, yeah, northern Kentucky, I'm northern Kentucky. I am at the tip of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, right? But if I'm south from Cincinnati, okay, yeah, nice. yeah. So yeah, you're you're the first one away right now. So, um, but anyway, thank you everybody for joining me uh, tonight. Uh, tonight we are with uh, Lightroom, uh, and I got uh, a pretty interesting lesson. Uh, but before I get into it, I just want to mention for our local. Uh, members that I am working on putting together a little workshop, uh, a, a, um, a live uh, event workshop with models and uh, lighting uh, at a place called the, um, I don't know if it has an official name, but it's, it's an abandoned quarry at Sleeping Giant Mountain. I've never been there before. I got introduced to it this past, uh, last week actually, and I fell in love with the place. Uh, uh, so it turned into kind of like a scouting uh, day and I took a bunch of photos and we're gonna be using one of those photos to edit. Uh, so I wanna show you what the place looks like and I'm looking at the end of the month, uh, probably the last Saturday uh, of the month, which I think is what, the 28th or something like that, 27th. Um, so anyway, uh, I have one model lined up. Uh, I'm hoping maybe getting a, a, another model, maybe two more, uh, and then we'll just build a workshop around it. So stand by for that. Uh, other than that, I don't have anything else uh, going. Oh, no, I do have something else. It hasn't been uh, decided what day, but uh, a while back I, I put out a poll. I have a, a next door neighbor who does cosplay, and the it was a, a toss up between Deadpool or Spider Man, and Spider Man um, kind of won out. Uh, the only problem is he's not available on the weekend, so we can't do a weekend shoot. Uh, it would have to be during the weekday, probably after work. Uh, so this will probably be in conjunction with uh, Milford Photo. We'll put together a little photo shoot. Uh, I, I got to come up with some ideas of how to photograph a superhero so it makes it look like, you know, he's doing heroic things. Uh, Spider-Man is a, a classic uh, superhero uh, and, you know, everybody knows all the famous poses that he puts, you know, with the web slinging and the wall crawling. So I want to try to replicate that uh, photographically so it's it's fun for the photographer, safe for the model without, you know, really stressing them out. So uh, that's in the works as well. All right. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, let's get into today's lesson. So one of the things that uh, you've heard me teach over and over again is when you're unsure about how to edit, the first thing you should do is look at your images and try to figure out or, or try to analyze it and pick out what you find wrong with your image. All right. Some things are are very easy. Uh, a crooked horizon, 
uh, you know, maybe the color temperature's off. You know, these are very easy things to, to fix. Uh, but one of the things that tends to slip by me simply because I've been doing this for so long uh, is that I have to stop myself and think back to when I first started editing. And I'm like, yeah, some of the things that are, are very obvious to me now weren't as obvious back then. It's a, it's a learning process. You build up the tools as you get exposed to them. OK, so uh, I decided uh, a while back I was going to kind of change it up a little bit and do more of a workflow edit with a variety of different uh, techniques and hoping that by repetition, you'll come to understand some of these things. Uh, and of course, by example, uh, you get to learn the tools to accomplish those. Now, previously, uh, I did a talk on going beyond the rule of thirds, where I talked about uh, different, I don't want to say rules, but different uh, uh, suggestions for composition based on how the mind looks at and, and uh, um, dissects and distills imagery. There's a very specific science to it. There's a psychology to it. Uh, and the more you learn about that, uh, the, the stronger your compositions can get when you keep those things in mind because you're working with the way people look at your images rather than fighting against it. But again, that comes with practice. It comes with being exposed to the proper techniques. So I figure I'm going to change it up a little bit this time around uh, and I'm, I'm going to show you I have three images that I edited okay uh, I want you to look at these and ask yourself probably the most important uh, question when it comes to your photography what is the subject or you, you can also say, what is the story of the image? All right. One of the things that I'd like to tell people is that un unless the image is purposely made to be ambiguous, all right, people looking at your image shouldn't have to guess at what it is that you're trying to show them. All right. Because when there's there's that ambiguity, it's like, well, you know, what is it I'm supposed to be looking at here? That's when the image kind of fails, All right? That doesn't mean an image shouldn't ask questions of the viewer, all right? But you shouldn't have to look for that question. You shouldn't have to ask, what is the story that I'm, I'm being asked to uh, look at here, okay? Even if an image is supposed to be purposely ambiguous, that ambiguity should be easy to read. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, in other words, the intent of the image should kind of like smack you in the face when you look at it, all right? They tend to be the most um, um, accepted images, you know, that that retain the viewer. OK, so uh, one of the things that I, I make a note of is an image doesn't have to be this great big masterpiece. All right. Where it's like, oh, my God, you know, I love this photographer. All right. Because there are levels to the type of photos that we make. Some photos are very personal. You know, we, we, we do it for ourselves. Others is just to document a, an event uh, or a time period in our lives or, or a location. All right. And it, it may only need to be accepted by a small group of people. Okay. 
Uh, uh, others may seem a little bit mundane. You know, I'm a product photographer. I don't, when I photograph products, I'm not looking to make masterpieces. That's not the intent of those photos. The intent is for them to be able to be sold by the client, all right, the, the product, not the photo, okay? So there are levels, okay? But within those levels, there's that core foundation of what is the story? What is the subject? Okay, and that's what you should keep in mind. All right, so I'm gonna show you these three that I've already edited, all right? Uh, I want you to ask yourself, what is the story and or what is the subject, okay? And the answer should be, if I did my job properly, should be very obvious, okay? And then I'll show you the before picture and we'll walk through the process of editing. And I'm gonna show you something a little bit different that I recently learned. Um, it's, it's a different way of thinking about uh, color editing that frankly, uh, it never occurred to me until I, I just learned it. I wanted to share it with you, okay? So anyway, let me switch over to the desktop. Actually, let me get my desktop prepped first. And okay. All right, let me let me take my ugly mug off. So you can see this. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the first image. Okay. All right. This is the second image. <laughs> Sorry if you don't like snakes. It's a little garden snake, so it's not like uh, dangerous or anything. And this is the third image. Okay. All right. <clears throat> like I said, they're not award-winning images. <clears throat> you know, I'm not going to win any awards with them. Uh, and as you saw, they're not like the most fantastic images, all right? They're not going to be adorning somebody's wall as, as wall art. Nobody's going to want to buy them because, you know, they're kind of eh, all right? But even the eh, I want to make them pretty, okay? So the first image uh, is the uh the location uh at, at the abandoned quarry in sleeping giant mountain okay and this is all that remains of it is this you know just the, the foundations and these columns and let me tell you oh i had so much fun photographing these because you know if, if you've ever gone into like abandoned locations there's just something about capturing the mystery and, and the history of these abandoned locations and even though there's not much left to this building uh, it just you know uh it, it created so many photographic opportunities with different types of compositions and this is the location I'm looking to hold a lighting workshop with some models. So I'm thinking about getting some models and some fancy outfits and just photographing them in and amongst the ruins. But anyway, so this is the edited image, all right? And uh, obviously you can tell exactly what it is that is being photographed. It's a, uh, uh, some foundational ruins in amongst the trees, okay? And uh, what I used here is a couple of, of techniques to make the uh, subject very prominent. Um, as you can see, there's a, a sense of scale, all right? Even though uh, the building at one point was pretty large and if you are walking in and around amongst the ruins you know you feel kind of dwarfed by these columns but when you step back 
even those ruins are dwarfed by the size of the trees because nature is literally coming in and reclaiming everything. All right. This used to be a working quarry. You can't see any of the of the rocks anymore. Uh, it's just been overtaken by uh, by by the greenery. OK, so in order for the subject to really stand out, uh, I had to do a couple of things and let me show you what it looked like beforehand. All right. This is what it looked like before. OK, kind of blah. Uh, well, in my opinion, all right? But if you've ever been in a location uh, where you, you're you emotionally invested in it, all right, you want to kind of transfer that emotion into your images so that it carries through the for the person who is looking at it, okay? And when I came upon it, I didn't look at it as this eh, blah, mundane, uh, you know, display of, you know, raw concrete in amongst the, the trees on a, on a rather overcast, hazy day. That's not the emotion I felt. The emotion I felt was like, oh my God, this place is so cool. I, my mind was reeling. I was looking for different angles to photograph. It's like uh, my mind was going a mile a minute. I was picturing, you know, uh, placing models in different locations. It's like, oh, I wish I had a model right now to to photograph, you know. So obviously, when you take the photo, you're you're not just capturing the moment but you're trying to capture that emotion behind it but when you open up your image and you see it like this well it, it kind of deflates you a little bit you go ah yeah that's not quite how i experienced it all right maybe how it looks but it's not how i experienced it okay so Part of me, the artist side, says, oh, I need to beautify this image. I want, I want to make it prettier than what I actually captured it because that's how I saw it. I saw it being so much more beautiful in its, in its starkness and its dilapidated state. Okay, so what are the obvious things that really stick out well one is that there there is a certain amount of contrast between the grayness of the buildings and the greenery right and the first thing that really comes to my mind is that the color balance even though that's really how it was is a little bit too green okay because the only other color available here are grays it was a, an overcast sky it was gray all right there's there's really nothing up up in the sky area okay and the the gray of the concrete uh isn't very appealing even though that's what it is. So I wanted to imbue it with a little bit more mood, a little bit more fantasy, okay? So how do we go about doing that, all right? Well, as you can see, one of the things that I did was I, I toned down, all right? Actually, let me go ahead. I'm gonna make a uh, virtual copy. All right, so uh, all you got to do is just right click on the center image or you can right click on the thumbnail down below and about halfway down the menu is create virtual copy. So I'm going to click on that. All right, and let me just bring this up. Okay. And what I want you to notice is that right here, 
Oh, hold on. My spotlight. Or let me turn on my spotlight thing here. Or my zoom, rather. Okay. Right here in the corner, uh, it looks like the, the corner of the image is curled up. That lets you know that this is a virtual copy of your image. Okay. And uh, let me let me sit down for this. I've been on my feet all day. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Okay. And what that means is that it's it's not making a physical copy of your image file. All right. Because Lightroom works non-destructively. What it's going to do, uh, well, whenever you do any kind of editing in Lightroom, what it does is it creates a little file separate from your image that catalogs all the changes that you made with the, uh, with the program, all right? Whether you uh, lighten it, you, you know, open the shadows, drop down the, the highlights, crop it, skew it, whatever it is. It gets put into that little, uh, what I call a recipe card. Okay, so when you create a virtual copy, what you're telling Lightroom to do is just start a new recipe card. Okay, just start a new recipe card. Okay, and because I've already edited this, it's going to copy all the edits as well. All right, and this is a great little tool to keep in mind if you want to experiment with different types of editing techniques for your image, okay? All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and hit the, the reset. Oh, hit the reset right there. Actually, let me bring this back down. We don't need that to be so large. Okay. All right. And uh, when I reset it, you can see it's gone back to our original uh, image. All right. Now, whenever you do any kind of editing with Lightroom, you have to understand there's two types of edits available. Global edits. And these are the edits that affect the entire image and local edits. Local edits are edits that are done for a very specific part of your image. And in order to get to local edits, you need to tell Lightroom, I only want to target this specific area. And mostly that's done through masks, okay? So we're gonna use a combination of global edits and local edits, okay? Now, one of the one of the techniques for editing that I I just recently learned is um, kind of a color control using the hue saturation and luminance sliders, right? And it was uh, a, a little interesting because it, like I said, it's a different way of editing than I ever thought of. And what you're actually doing is you're controlling the various levels of the individual color cha channels in order to create a pleasing uh, um, color composition, all right? Not necessarily a physical composition because that's already locked in, but a, we're altering the colors, all right? So if we go to our saturation, all right, saturate, oh, saturation uh, on our HSL panel, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of these sliders and we're going to drag them all the way to the left, which removes 100% of the color. You can see it says negative 100 all the way on the right-hand side. And what we basically have is a black and white image, okay? But obviously, we're not going to stay with a black and white image. We are actually going to be editing a color image, all right? And 
the interesting thing about this particular approach is that not every image needs every one of these channels, all right? So if you if you look at it here, we have seven channels, red, orange, yellow, green, aqua, blue, purple, and magenta, which roughly, roughly corresponds with RGB CMY K. Well, K is not, not in here, okay? Um, but we have certain channels, like for example, with skin tone, all right? Uh, there's a lot of oranges in skin tone. So we have that orange slider, okay? And the one thing you have to understand about the HSL slider, it does not directly correlate with RGB channels. Doesn't work that way. All right, it's a, it's a different editing process. It's a different chat. It's a different color engine uh, that's that's uh, separate from from the RGB that we're normally used to associating with the way um, cameras make images. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start bringing our sliders back and. This is a technique that I've shown you before. If you're not sure what a slider does, push it to the extremes. Okay, now you notice when I move that red slider, nothing is happening to my image, which tells me that there's nothing that's red in that image. Okay, that should also tell you because nothing's being affected, it's not affecting the red channel of our uh, uh, of our initial photograph. Okay. All right. You know that old old um, um, kind of gotcha uh, quiz that I say. What does your color camera take? Does it take color images or black and white images? Okay. If you want to, if you want to catch a, a newbie, they'll say, "Oh, it takes color images." No, it takes three black and white images. All right. So uh, the next one's the orange. Okay, and look at that. As soon as I bring it all the way to the opposite side, I'm starting to see some of the orange hues come out from the building. So that's clue number one. Hmm. Maybe I can use that orange hue to kind of help separate it from its environment, okay? Because look at here, just by itself, with everything grayed out, already our eye goes to that part of the image because that is the only part that is in color, okay? All right, so hopefully you're getting a, a little bit of an aha moment. Okay. All right. So we can go back. Let's check out what the yellow does. All right. And if we bring the yellow, we see that there's a lot of yellow pretty much everywhere in our image. Okay. There's yellow in the green foliage. There's yellow in the grass. And there's even yellow in the building, uh, in the foundations of the building. Okay. So keep that in mind. Okay. Because that should, right now, that should trigger uh, a little comment in your head saying, wow, I, I can't use yellow to separate one element from another because it's attacking the entire image, okay? Unlike the orange, okay? All right, let's do the green. The green should be fairly obvious. Look at that. Okay, the green is tackling everything that the orange left out. Okay, there's another clue. All right, aqua. Yeah, I I, I kind of figured nothing there. There's nothing blue in my image. Yeah, because it was a very overcast sky. So I'm just going to get gray up there. Okay. Uh, definitely no purple and definitely no magenta. 
okay? So that means there's only three colors that we need to really concern ourselves with the editing of this image. How much easier does that make it for you to understand how to edit your image? You only got to deal with three colors, right? All right. <clears throat> All right. So obviously we want to bring the green into the scene, right? So now we start bringing the, the green slider up. <clears throat> and we have to start thinking about how do we want to bring that green back? <clears throat> because green is one of those colors that can go one of two ways. We can have green that goes to the warm side by introducing yellow to it. And green can also go to the cool side by introducing blue to it, okay? Whereas orange, well, that one's a little bit more restrictive. Orange by tradition is a very warm color. We can cool it off, but it's no longer orange. It starts going into the browns, okay? When we cool off orange, it goes to brown, all right? So if I want to create a separation between the building and, and the foliage around it, if I know orange needs to go to the warm side, by default, if I want to create a little bit of contrast between the two, I want to make sure that my green starts going to the cool side. Make sense? Because if they both go to the warm side, they kind of mesh a little bit together. Okay? That's not necessarily a bad thing. All right, so for example, if I were photographing a subject against that background, I would want both those elements to go to the warm and maybe keep my subject to the cool side or vice versa, okay? But in this particular case, I actually want to create a separation between the two. So I'm going to use that, that color uh, warmth and, and coolness to create that, se that separation, okay? So I'm going to bring up my greens to the point where I think it looks appropriate for the scene, okay? Remember, my goal is to make the subject a little bit more prevalent, okay? Now, when I push the orange up all the way, well... Obviously, it's not really reading a very strong contrast, okay? So there is an obvious problem right there, okay? Now, remember what I said about the yellow slider? The yellow attacks everything. So if I bring the yellow up, we're going to bring the green to the warm side because we're you know, yellow is a very warm color, okay? All right, but it's also going to introduce yellow to the orange, which is what we want, okay? But now, because everything is so warm, we're, we're starting to lose that contrast, okay? So obviously, there's only so much we can do with this particular tool but we have an understanding of where we want to go. Right, follow? Make sense? Okay. So now let's think about how do we separate the two further? Well, let's take a look at what we have available for us in local adjustments, okay? Uh, oh, actually, you know what? Uh, before I do that, all right, I, I want to I, I want you to understand that when you start building your understanding of the tools, you start understanding how they relate to each other. All right. And then it allows you the opportunity to weigh one against the other 
and to see kind of where it's going to fit into your editing process. Okay, so right now we we discussed the hue saturation luminance sliders, but only with the saturation, only with saturation. We haven't touched, uh, we haven't adjusted uh, or modified the hue on any of those colors. And we haven't talked about the luminosity of uh, using light to direct our eye, okay? Which is another part of the process. Right now we're just dealing with color, okay? So now, off the top of your head, can you think of what else in the global part of Lightroom deals with color temperature? color temperature, all right? The basic panel right at the very top, the first one is color temperature, okay? But this is a global adjustment. So I say if I want to make my image cooler, I'm gonna drag that slider to the left and it's going to introduce blue into my image, all right? Basically, it's removing yellow, all right? And of course, if I bring it the other way to warm it up, I start introducing yellows, all right? But just as previously with the HSL slider, okay, with that yellow slider, it's global. So it's gonna take the yellow, which we already know, influences the green, and also influences the orange. So we can't really rely on the uh, color temperature alone to fix our problem. But in conjunction with a couple of other tools, and this is where you know understanding the tools comes into play, okay? I can say, all right, I can cool off a part of the image with the color temperature, but I can also warm up parts of the image with the color temperature, all right? All by using local adjustments, all right? So now I have to decide which way am I gonna go with the local adjustment, okay? So, the first thing I do is I look at my overall image and I say, what is the predominant color in this particular scene? And that's the green, okay? The orange part is a small portion of the, this image and it's very localized in that lower third section, okay? So it kind of makes sense to use a local adjustment on the ruins to warm that up, all right? So by default, the opposite of that is to cool the image down, all right? So that when I warm up the building, we get that, that contrast, all right? So my global adjustment will be to cool off the image. All right. Obviously, I don't want to, you know, make it look like, you, you know, this kind of like winter scene. All right. But I do want to introduce more bluish greens than yellow greens. All right. So I'm just going to cool it off just a little bit. OK. And. Uh, you know what? No, no. And forget it. Forget it. I'll, I'll, I'll tackle one piece at a time. All right, so now, now that I've cooled everything off, I lost all my orange in, in my, uh, my foundations, right? So I'm gonna come here and I go to masking. My favorite uh, mask is the radial gradient. And I'm just going to create a nice large mask that kind of, sort of fits over the general area, okay? All right, and by default, it's going to show you that that colored overlay. All right, if you don't want to see the color overlay, 
All you gotta do is just click on that show overlay and uncheck that, all right? But you'll notice that as soon as you make uh, an adjustment, it's going to remove it anyway. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna warm up those buildings, okay? And I'm gonna push it quite a bit here, all right? And now all of a sudden, we're, we've brought back our orange, okay? All right, so now, when you, you start doing these edits, you're gonna find that it's going to be a little bit of a juggling act, all right? Because we're, we're tackling we're tackling the same things with different tools, all right? And these different tools are going to affect it slightly differently, all right? So what you'll notice is that when you move one tool, when you make an adjustment on one tool, it may overdo it someplace else, and you need to compensate for that with a different tool, all right? And you'll see what I mean uh, in a little bit, okay? So right now I'm just going to probably make this just right on that very predominant part of the um, of the of the building, okay? All right, and everybody knows how to use this, right? Uh, the inner circle represents the 100 to 50 percent of the effect, and from the middle circle to the outer circle means it's it's uh, uh, from 50 percent to to zero. Okay, so it, it creates a gradient. All right, and when you show the uh, the overlay, you can see how it kind of fades off. Uh, as it goes to the edge, okay? All right. So there we we brought our color back, okay? And we hit, okay, we hit done. I can go back to my hue saturation and we can see if uh, any of these really do anything, all right? All right, so now we have our color. Okay, I'm pretty happy with the way the color looks. However, color alone is not drawing my eye to the subject. The other part of the equation is the control of light. Okay, and right now, if we squint, uh, those of you who don't know this little trick, if you squint your eyes and you look at your scene, it will show you where all the lights and the darks are in your scene, okay? And what we want is we want the ruins to be the lightest part of our image. So all that foliage around it, I want to knock the luminosity down, all right? So now let's think about it. What tools are available? Well, we have our shadow and light our exposure, all right? And of course, in the hue saturation tab that we have here that's open, we also have the luminosity tab, okay? All right, so we can see, all right, all that green foliage around it, all right? If we bring it down, okay, we're making it darker, all right? However, because the saturation part of this tool is just selecting the green, it's kind of creating a big mess, all right? So that's not our solution, okay? So this means we have to go to our basic tab, all right? So what we want to do is we want to kind of deepen our shadows, okay? and maybe even control our highlights. There's nothing I can do with the sky, pretty much. The sky, it, it's shot, all right? The only thing I can do is maybe, maybe do a sky replacement, but 
to tell you honestly, uh, having some kind of clouds up there, I don't think is going to add anything to the image. Okay. But that's something that we can look at a little bit down the road. Okay. So let's bring our blacks. Okay. One of the things that you can do is if you hold the alt key or the option key for you Mac people, as you move the black and white, you'll notice that the areas of deep black start become visible. All right. And this is a good way of being able to set your black point. As soon as you start seeing these little bits of black, that means those areas that are being highlighted have gone to 100% pure black pixels. There's no way of regaining any kind of detail from them. However, you have to make that, that conscious choice about your image. Does it matter if it goes completely black? Okay. In this particular case, I don't care because it's the deepest, darkest recesses of the, the, uh, the, the woods. Okay. And it's very scattered. All right. The same technique works with your whites. If you press and hold the alt key, all right. And you can see that as I go up, I am turning that sky to 100% white with no chance of ever regaining anything. Do I accomplish anything with having it go to complete white? No, I don't accomplish anything. However, do I want an all white sky? Nah, it's a little too stark, all right? So I definitely don't want to push my whites up, okay? So you can see that you know, right about these 15, 10, 10 to 15 mark, it is just hitting that edge of, of whiteness, okay? But because it's in a part of the image that I don't care about, you know, you know what? That's not really going to affect me, all right? Now, if I bring it the other way to see if I can reclaim anything, I'm not reclaiming anything in the sky, all right, but you have to be careful of what it does in the lower parts, okay? Right now, there's really nothing that sits within that spectrum that's called whites on, on actually, I should say it's uh, this side, all right, of your, of your uh, histogram. Uh, nothing in there screams in the white section. So that slider really has very little effect, all right? However, the next one over, which is your highlights, that one definitely has something. So now, because my main goal here is the greenery, I'm not gonna be too concerned about the part of the foundation that's orange. That's not my concern, all right? So you have to get into the practice of ignoring certain aspects during your your editing process, okay? So I'm going to just, I don't want to kill all the specular highlights off the trees because <clears throat> I want people to read it as it's a daytime shot, okay? Just a moody shot, all right? So I have to be careful how much of that I bring down, okay? But I do want to bring my shadows down because I want to really <clears throat> introduce, <clears throat> excuse me, this is why I need this. <clears throat> I really want to introduce some, some mood, okay? All right, so that looks pretty good. So now <clears throat> I need to compensate with the uh, ruins by lightening that part up, okay? And the nice thing is we already have a mask for that. Uh, we don't need to build anything new, okay? This particular mask, all we did was control the color temperature. So we have all the, the, all the uh, sliders right below it 
that we can still use to adjust, okay? So we know there are no uh, whites in there, so I'm immediately gonna go to my highlights, okay? And I'm gonna bring that up, okay? But I want to counter it a little bit with my shadows because I don't wanna lift everything out in full brightness. Uh, I want to keep some mystery, okay? All right, and the whites actually, now that the the highlights have pushed more towards the, actually this way. Let me take a, a brief second, okay? Oops, what the heck? Press the wrong button. All right, if we look at our histogram, we have this first part, all right, that's our whites. You can see it's a very small section. Right next to it, that gets highlighted, that's our highlights, okay? We modified the highlights, and what we did is we took the highlights and brightened them up. So the highlights are now going towards our whites, Previously, the white slider alone did not do anything, but now that we've taken some of the pixels and pushed them towards the whites, that white slider is going to have an effect. Follow? All right. So now that we've pushed our, our highlights into the whites, we can come in with our whites and we can boost up the highlight areas all right, compensate with our shadow because we still want that highlight shadow contrast. Otherwise it looks kind of fake, okay? And obviously it's going to be to taste, but now all of a sudden we have that section of our image that is now fairly bright, okay? All right, it's competing with that sky though, all right? So call it done, all right? Let's go to our uh, highlights and see if we can bring that sky down a little bit. Oh yeah, there we go, okay? We can also, if, if we want to experiment, all right? Uh, and, and this is what I suggest. If you have a question, don't leave the question unanswered. Experiment with it, okay? Now, obviously that sky is very bright, but as you saw, as I was manipulating some of the sliders earlier, it wasn't 100% white to begin with. There's a little bit of, of data there. How much data? Let's figure it out. We can go back to our local exposure all right, and I'm going to create a new mask because I want to target just to sky. All right, now we can do a select sky, all right, or we can do a radial gradient, okay? I'm not a big fan of the select sky because it's not quite 100% there, okay? So I'm just gonna stick with what I like best and that's my radial gradient, okay? And I'm just going to go ahead and put that right into that upper sky area, okay? Now, in this mask feature, you can also, you know, double click and you can make labels, all right? And I suggest if you start getting into multiple masks, you start labeling it so that it makes it easier for you to see, okay? If you have one or two, you can just look at the mask and the placement and figure out what's what, okay? All right, so there's the sky. Let's bring, all right, our exposure down. If you can see some of that edge feathering is gonna affect the tops of those trees, all right? So yeah, it's pushing it pretty much to, to gray, all right? So there's, there's really nothing there, okay? But that's okay, a light, light gray, it's not going to really bother me all that much. Okay, I think uh, uh, what it's going to do is going to compete less with what's going down below. Okay, and of course, if I want to, I can always crop some of that sky out. All right, 
All right, so now just just with that alone, we've created a, a much moodier uh, scene, okay? It's looking a little dark, so I can come to our exposure and just add a, a kind of like an overall brightening of everything, okay? And we have a lot of this green in the foreground area right in here. All right, I think I'm gonna want to kind of control that a little bit. So I'm gonna come and create another mask. This time it's gonna be a linear gradient. I'm gonna come up from the bottom, just target the grass area, all right? And I'm going to bring my exposure down just a tiny little bit, about two thirds of a stop, okay? All right, and we can, what is it? Grass, there we go. Okay, and call it done, all right? And that's pretty much it, all right? This is before, oh, oh. <laughs> it's showing the before of the copy that I, I created, all right? So hold on a second. Let me create another virtual copy. Reset that. And I'll, I'll just do it like this, side by side. Okay? Side by side. All right, so you can see how uh, just controlling color tone, all right, uh, along with, you know, manipulating the light. And you can, if, if you paid close attention, You'll see that I really didn't push the the whites and or, or the the lights and the shadows that much. Okay, I think the most I did was up in that sky, uh, just because it's so bright. Okay, but now it just kind of sits the ruins in this mystical pool of light. So you're coming, you know, through through the woods onto this scene. And it just like, oh, okay. So now that, you know, it, 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 is it a little too much? Eh, some may argue. Okay. Yeah, it might be a little bit too much. But let me tell you, all right, the mood is kind of what I felt when I was there. All right. Yeah, you know, when you photograph it, it looks mundane, but the experience I had was awesome. It was magical. I wanted to spend the entire day photographing it, and that's what I want to convey. All right, any questions? No questions? Either I'm that good, which I know I'm not, <laughs> Make it very easy to follow. Okay. All right. Because that's your fault. That's your fault. You make it. Uh, uh, I'm getting better then. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to our. One question. Yeah. Oh, actually, yes. You have All right. Um, <clears throat> Bob. <clears throat> Bob, go ahead. Okay. I noticed you close down the bottom instead of clicking up the circle. Is there a difference between the two when you did the local adjustments? All right. When I did my local, let me go back. When I did my local adjustments. You went up to the circle, but then when you close uh, it, up to close, here, you close it down. Yeah, oh, close yes. It down the bottom. Does that make any difference? Okay, so, close down the bottom yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, when you click on, when you click on this masking button, it opens up the dialog box. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and you can add as many masks as you need. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and sure, you can, you can close it there. But I'm so used to the way it used to be, where you know you have the button down here that says done. Okay. No All right. So, what if there was a difference? Yeah. yeah. No. 
Uh, for me, it's just, uh, you know, uh, I go for the done button. It's whatever, Thank you. whatever, you know. Okay. Click on it. Click on it. Whatever. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Ligia. Uh, question. If you would like to print this image. Yep. Wouldn't the dark area would be way too dark? Yes. Because it would here it looks okay. Yes. If we put the print, then the dark image will be. Like, okay. We will, we will lose all the detail. Right. So uh, for that, you're going to need to really watch your um, uh, black and white points. Okay. And for print, what I would suggest is you go to the tone curve. Okay and you just open up your blacks just a little bit all right and bring your whites down just a little bit okay how much that's you know who knows i i don't do a lot of printing so i'm the wrong person to ask all right but from what I understand, different printers, different uh, results. So I would I would suggest if you do your own printing, you're going to find that sweet spot that works for your printer. And you may need to do a couple of test uh, prints uh, ahead of time. OK, and you can, you know, once you once you figure it out, all right, you just select your point and you could even type it in right here. All right, you can say, oh, you know, this printer needs my black point to be at at, uh, uh, at 20 and my white point to be at, you know, 245, whatever it is, okay? All right, and, uh, and pretty much that, that would be it. Uh, you can control it right from here. All right um because you can see uh it, it kind of dulls it out a little bit but you're going to regain that from the printer side okay all right any other questions no okay let's uh go ahead and move on to this one okay <laughs> As as Lehia, oh, you know what? Forget it. We'll we'll do this one. How's that? Okay. This is the before image. Okay. This is the before image. All right. Now, <clears throat> the interesting story about this image uh, uh, goes all the way back to my childhood. How, you ask? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, I bought my first camera with my own money that I made on my paper route. I had, uh, uh, in high school, I had a paper route. I bought it in my freshman year from a local, uh, a local kid. He had about 150 papers on his route. And then the following year, I bought an adjacent route and I had over 300 uh, customers that I would deliver to after school. I was rolling in money. I bought a 12 speed bicycle back in the 80s when there were no such things as 12 speed bicycles. All right. Uh, it was imported from France. I was rolling in money as a teenager. I bought my first camera, which was a Pentax K1000. And I would, I would shoot rolls of black and white film that I would um, uh, process in my, basically in, in, in my uh, upstairs bathroom. Okay, I, I kind of did this little makeshift dark room. Never printed my own stuff, I just, you know, uh, developed the, the rolls of film and sent that out to get printed. But right behind my house is a stream that runs from a reservoir down to the Housatonic River. 
and it's nothing but woodlands. That was my playground in my formative years. I loved being out in the woods and I would often take my camera and try to take pictures of the beauty around me, all right? But there were two things going against me. One, black and white film. Two, lack of understanding of how photography works. <laughs> so every time I developed these you know, images, I would get so frustrated because every image just didn't capture the magic that I felt. All right. And part of the process uh, or part of the reason was because I did not have complete control over the development process. I just had control of the take the picture process, which obviously at 14 years old was rather lacking. All right. So I was in a conversation with uh, the photographer that I scoped this uh, out with. And I said, one of these days, you know, I would love to be able to walk through the woods and see this <coughs> shaft of light that just illuminates that one little sapling trying to make its way up through the uh, dense canopy. All right. And as we were talking, I noticed this little tree and I just I took a grab shot. That's all this is. It's just a grab shot, okay? Because, of course, my mind is looking for that lonely illuminated tree, and you'll never find it when you want it, all right? So as I was putting things together for tonight's lesson, I said, I wonder, can I turn this into a lonely tree, all right? And I think I, I succeeded here, okay? And all this is is just a manipulation of light, all right? And if we break it down, you're gonna see how, how simple this is, all right? This is my basic panel, all right? If you notice, I never touched it. I didn't touch the color balance. I didn't touch any of the exposure, nothing, all right? It's all done with local adjustments, okay? And there's three of them, okay? Let me expand this back out, all right? A radial mask that, all right, here, let me show the overlay, okay? Selects everything but the, the that little clump of foliage. All right, so this is my background mask. All right, come on, double click. All right, so this is my background. Okay, the next one is a duplicate of the first one. All I did was uh, come to the uh, little ellipsis here. You click on that and you say duplicate. Okay, that's all I did. Okay. And you can say you can see that it says radial mass copy. All right. And this is going to be our tree. OK. And the last mask, you can see it's just at the very, very bottom, very similar to what we did with the previous image. And that's just our grass. All right. All right. So this first image or I, I'm sorry, this first mask, which targets the uh, outer part is working to darken down the background, all right? So you can see that, uh, uh, and I want you to notice that, oh, I keep pressing the wrong button, sorry guys. Uh, I, I cooled off our color temperature by a little bit, all right? So I took it from that bright green more into that, uh, um, Kelly or evergreen green, okay? And then we have our um, exposure slider, all right? It's about three quarters of a stop down, all right? So not, not much, okay? On top of that, 
I uh, brought the highlights down, all right? You know, leaves all have specular highlights, okay? I brought that down by about a half a stop. And my whites, which also contribute to the highlights, I brought that down about two thirds of a stop. And that's pretty much it for. I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, do you brush all around the tree? No. The no. Tree. All right. So this is, this is how I did it. Okay. Um, let me create a new mask just so you guys see. All right, radial gradient. When you make your radial gradient, by default, whatever you apply to it is going to be within that circle, all right? So if I apply like a, uh, to a brightening, okay? You'll see that it's brightening inside that circle, all right? In this particular case, I wanted to darken everything but what was in that circle. All right, so if we look uh, right underneath here, there's a little check mark that you can check that says invert, all right? And as soon as you check that, it inverts the effect. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna put the effect on the outside, all right? Okay, now keep that in mind because this particular in, uh, invert, all right, is why I have two of the same masks, all right, because, all right, let me just get rid of, of that mask. Oops. Uh, what I do, press the, where's my delete key? Delete key, all right. All right, so actually delete mask one. There we go. All right, so there's my background mask, all right. I selected that little patch of, gr of uh, green on the tree and I said everything but I want to make it darker, okay? And we covered that, not by much, just enough, okay? I then went duplicate background, which gives me this one, all right? Which I, I kind of just kind of brought it in a little bit, all right? And what I did there is I kind of, um, let me see if I can, hold on, let me see if I can show, oh yeah, here, I'm gonna turn off the effect. Oh, no, it, it, it takes it off everything. All right, oh, I know, here it is, right here. All right, yeah, all right. See all the background stuff in between? All right, uh, let me zoom in. All right, all those little pieces of greenery that fall behind, okay? None of that was affected by my first uh, um, mask, okay? So I needed to I needed a way to handle that from an actual mask that encompasses everything. So what you'll notice here that I tackled the shadows, all right, because the shadow part resides behind the bright part of my main subject, okay? I brought the shadows down, all right? Oh, let me select. All right, brought my shadows down. Oh, what am I? Oh, I <laughs> be nice if I turned it back on, right? All right, so you can see that that's just targeting the dark side of this, this part of the image, all right? Not the very bright, all right? So I'm taking advantage of the distance between this and this, okay? All right, so I, I, and what I did is I boosted the contrast, all right? So I said, all right, whatever shadow and highlight there is, let's increase the distance between those, all right? So it brightens up my brights a little bit, pushes it forward, 
takes the, the shadows, pushes it back, all right? And now all that foliage in between, visible through the bright leaves, now starts matching what I did with the previous filter. Make sense, I hope? Good, okay. And then the last thing I needed to handle was this bright part on the bottom, just to bring our vision up. That's all I did. Three local adjustments got me from here to here. All right. So hopefully that's a different way of thinking about editing. All right. And as you can see, just looking at my basics tab, nothing. I touched nothing on that basics tab. All right. As a matter of fact, I touched nothing on any of these tabs. All right. Oh, less correction. That's that's about it. Okay. Oh, uh, I may have. Nope. I didn't even touch anything on my calibration, which I sometimes do. Okay. All right. So three simple local adjustments tab, uh, um, local adjustment masks uh, transform this image. All right. Any questions about any of the things that I did here? All right. All right. So hopefully it makes you think a little bit different about how you use masks. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Lihia, uh, we have time for one more, our snake. Okay. And actually, if I'll we go, I handle it. I handle it. You'll handle it. All right. I can handle it. I just got this quick way. All right. Let me take off. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Where is my filters? None. Uh, here we go. This one. And this one and this one. Okay. All right. So I have, I have two variations of uh, this edit. Okay. You can see one is a little bit more muted. So it, it tends to be a little bit more natural, while the second one is definitely uh, very much a, a more saturated uh, image, all right? And just so you know, this is a garden snake. So they are very, very, they're skittish. They will run away from you, okay? Uh, this, this guy didn't. He just kind of sat there and let me take pictures. So you can see, you know, he kind of has a little bit of a smile on his face. He's smiling for the camera. <laughs> All right. So what did we do for this one? All right. This one, I handled the, uh, the same way with the hue saturation. All right. And what I want you to notice is that the same three sliders that I used for uh, editing the ruins are the same sliders that I used for handling this one, okay? Orange, yellow, and green uh, are the most predominant ones in a lot of nature photography, all right? Uh, obviously blue if you have any kind of blue sky, but overall, those are the three main ones, okay? So if we toggle that off, you can see how bright that green grass is, all right? Uh, and because uh, grass has a lot of yellow in it, you can see it in here, all right? Uh, uh, it it kind of just, all your attention just goes to that green grass that is kind of like in front of, of uh, our subject. All right, so I needed to push that back a little bit, all right? So to push it back, you just remove uh, a lot of the saturation from it. You remove a lot of the luminosity from it, all right? So this is one where I actually tackled the luminosity on the green just to knock it down a little bit, all right? 
And the nice thing about this one, all right, actually, if we go back to our saturation and we bring all of these down, <clears throat> again, use that little trick where you slide each one by itself. You can see red's not really doing anything. A little bit in the leaves, but not much, all right? Orange, wow, look at that. Orange is right around our subject. It's even in our subject. All right. So there's clue number one. Okay. Green, we know. Green, look at that. It attacks everything but our subject. All right. So it's the same principle as the ruins. All right. Yellow. All right. You can see yellow. <clears throat> while it some of it is being shared by a subject it's mostly in the grass to the right hand side of our image all right so and then aqua blue purple magenta they don't do anything okay all right so now we can say okay well i don't want to bring uh my greens all the way up to where they were originally i want to knock it down a little bit all right, so I knocked the saturation out of it. All right, same thing with our uh, orange, okay? And the same thing with our yellow, all right? I don't want to bring the yellows up too much, okay? Yellow contributes to that green, so I want to make sure that the green on the left and the green on the right are right about even with each other. Okay, all right, and there we go. And right there, just, just that alone uh, really separates everything else, you know. Okay. And uh, the other thing you can do if you want all right, if you want to make it more obvious, you can always create a local adjustment just like we did previously <clears throat> by controlling the luminosity. But another thing that we can do is we can add a vignette. All right, vignette is right here in your effects panel. All right, come on, there we go. All right. Uh, uh, by sliding it to the left, it gives us a dark outer corners, okay? So we can kind of control where the eye goes in, all right? So Lightroom comes uh, preloaded with uh, these vignette presets, the latest version, all right? So you can uh, take and use them, okay? So that's pretty much all I did with this particular uh, image. All right, but then I said, you know what? <clears throat> that works well for the people who want something to look natural. But let's take it up a notch, all right? And I said, well, let's let's push the saturation levels up a little bit more, all right? So again, going to our hue saturation level, all right? Uh, I didn't really do much here, all right, or in the luminosity. What I did was I used the, the radial filter right here, and I used my exposure and contrast uh, and texture and clarity, all right? When you push texture and clarity up, it's gonna push a little bit of saturation, okay? Uh, just by default, all right? So by brightening up that little central part, it just kind of naturally uh, brightens up all the colors. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Not very much. It's just a, a matter of controlling uh, not just the light, but also the color to direct the person's eye. All right. So the same techniques that I explained in the, the first edit uh, are used in this one. All right. Any uh, any questions? Uh, let me turn that off with any of these. Look, I do have one, one question. Sure. I, for some reason, I, I get confused between 
Lightroom and Lightroom Classic, which is Lightroom <clears throat> Lightroom Classic is the full desktop version. Lightroom is designed for mobile application. All right, so it doesn't it doesn't have the uh, full range of tools. All right. So Lightroom, Lightroom is what I should use on a PC, and Lightroom Classic is on my mobile unit. No, 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 the other way around. Oh, like I said, I. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so just think about what is a classic car. A classic car is a car that came before everything else. All right. Okay. Lightroom Classic came before everything else. All right. So what was our first Lightroom? It was a desktop application. All right. <clears throat> so hopefully that'll uh, that'll straighten it out for you. That, that, that finalizes it. Okay. Yeah. The, the reason I, I don't really bother with the other ones is one, I want all the features, all right? I don't, me personally, I don't do any editing mobily, all right? But if you do, everything that you learn here with the Lightroom Classic also applies to whatever tools are available in Lightroom Mobile. It's just that it's Lightroom uh, Mobile is designed for working on tablets uh, you know, and of course now they have the web-based version, all right? But you're not going to get the full functionality that you do with uh, Lightroom Classic, okay? All right, any questions? All right. Yeah, Doug, we're going to go back over how to do the preset on the internet. All right. On my phone. Okay. I know you went over it, but... Yep. I'm going to see that. that. No, that, that's fine. Okay. Um, all right. So no questions about any of, of the things we covered, right? Before we move on. All right. So uh, before we started the session, Bob asked me a question. Why is that popping up? Don't ask me how I got there. I have obviously my cursor is falling on something. Oh, there it is. The weather, okay. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, uh, before we started recording, Bob asked me a question about uh, creating a uh, a preset that gets applied during ingest, all right? And what I mean by ingest is when you take your images from your camera and bring it into your Lightroom catalog, okay? And there are uh, a couple of presets that you can apply. One handles all your, uh, um, like your copyright notice, all your metadata, all right? Uh, which is not what you need, right? Okay. What you want I, is, I know that one. yeah, what you want is uh, when it brings the images in, you want Lightroom to do a certain amount of editing to your images, which is usually what I recommend, all right? Um, so one of the things that I teach is the first thing you want to do with your images is you want to normalize them as best as possible before you start getting into your creative edits. And what normalizing means is you're going to correct for certain things, all right? Uh, such as applying a lens correction automatically, all right? Uh, which, what that means is, is that uh, if you're using a wide angle lens, it'll get rid of that barrel distortion. If you're using a telephoto lens, it'll, it'll uh, handle the, um, the natural vignetting that occurs with long lenses. Uh, it may be uh, uh, something like uh, assigning a new color um, um, profile to your images. Uh, you can even do automatic noise reduction. Uh, you can have it handle um, all kinds of stuff, all right? 
So one of the things that I do with my images is, you know, um, aside from the, the normal lens um, uh, correction and the noise reduction, uh, I tend to add a little bit of contrast to my images, all right, by, um, you know, just a, adjusting a few things, okay? And I don't know if I've even uh, brought them in here. Uh, I haven't, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new one. All right, let me just pick an image. It, it doesn't matter what image. Uh, I'm just going to, let me, I'll, I'll just pick this one, okay? And I'm just gonna reset this. For, yeah, uh, actually, that's already reset. Okay, so to make to make your import preset, all right, it's basically an adjustment or a develop preset that gets applied during import. So what you want to do is you want to say, okay, what are the things that I want Lightroom to automatically do to my images before I even start, okay? Well, there are certain things that it can't handle because it won't know, all right? Because everything that Lightroom does is literal, all right? So some, for example, uh, if you have a crooked horizon, all right? I don't think this horizon is crooked, but some, a, a lot of my images, they tend to have a slightly downward slant to the, to the horizon, especially towards the end of the day when my arm gets tired, all right? But the angle may not be the same for all the images. Lightroom cannot figure that out on its own. There's no automatic, you know, leveling, all right? So that's not something that we can build into the, the preset, all right? But there are certain things, all right? So for example, we can go to our lens correction Okay, and where it says remove chromatic aberrations, we can check that. Enable uh, profile correction, we can change, we can check that. Okay, uh, and you know, uh, the setup, we want it to be auto. Okay, and what that's going to do is it's going to read the metadata from your files, look up your lens, and apply the appropriate. Uh, uh, what you call it? All right. Uh, I'm using a TIFF file, so it's not going to find the color. All right. Um, actually, let me here. Let me go to. All right. Here we go. Remove. All right. Remove chromatic. Enable color profile. And there. All right. We have all our uh, uh, lens information automatically filled in. All right. So we want that to say auto, okay? All right, so that's our lens correction. What else do we want it to do, all right? Well, I kind of like a little bit of uh, contrast, all right? Um, I tend to like having uh, that that texture and clarity brought up. I the from experience, okay, this is from experience because I do this over and over and over again. I tend to go with 20 on texture, 10 on clarity at the minimum. Sometimes I'll boost that more, but you know, at least this is a start, okay? Some people don't like as much, so salt and pepper to taste. Don't do what I do, do what looks good to you, okay? Uh, I also know that uh, my camera tends to go a little heavy on the highlights, so I tend to want to bring uh, my highlights down. Maybe I'll, I'll go uh, 20 points down, uh, maybe you know 10 points down on my whites, okay? And maybe open up my uh, shadows and, oops, and my my uh, blacks a little bit, okay. And from experience, you will see that there are certain things that you do to every image, okay. 
So this is something that I do to every image, all right? So now I want to save this, all right? So we're gonna go over all the way to the uh, left-hand side. We're gonna click on where it says presets. We're gonna click on that little plus and you can see it says add new preset, okay? Create preset. Huh? Your head's over it. Oh, oh, Come oh, oh, oh. Let's switch me over. All right. Okay. All right. Let's let's go. Let's do that again. All right. Presets. The little plus symbol. All right. You click on that little plus symbol. Create preset. It's going to bring up this uh, uh, dialog box. Okay. And the first thing you want to do is give it a name. All right. Now, in this particular case, I'm building a very specific preset to be used on import. So let's call it import. All right. Call it whatever makes sense to you. You can call it import uh, normal, import normalization. Okay. Whatever it is. All right. Next one down. Uh, where in this list do you want to save it, all right? Um, it's not gonna save it to a, um, uh, a predefined uh, folder in Lightroom. And it can only use it, it can only import it, it can only create it in a user accessible folder, all right? So you will usually have one that says users, all right? I rename, uh, you know, um, user presets. I've created a couple, one that says clients, which are, I use those for client work. And I have one that I created called masks, which I, that's exactly what they're for, all right? So we're gonna keep it in my user preset. You can put it wherever you want. And then the important part is the lower section. What I suggest you do is immediately, all right, whether you're building this one or any other, immediately go and check none, okay? All right, because by default, it's going to be populated with whatever you used the last time. So I uh, automatically, I come in and I check none, okay? And then now you have to kind of remember what it is that you changed, all right? So in this particular case, I did not do anything with treatment and color profiles, all right? I did not do anything with white balance. I did not do anything with exposure or contrast, but I did do highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks, as well as textures and clarity. So I'm gonna go ahead and check those, okay? I didn't do anything else with any other stuff other than my lens correction. And so I'm just gonna highlight that whole thing because I want all of that to be automatically done, okay? Uh, obviously nothing with transform, nothing with vignette or grain, and nothing with calibration because all those other things are done salt and pepper to taste, okay? All right. Once you have everything checked, all right, you go ahead and hit create. All right, and here it is, my user presets, all the way at the very, very top here, okay? There it is, import normal, import normal, okay? Now, if we right click, Right there, the second one down, apply on import. All right, so you don't even have to go to your, your uh, import dialog box. Apply on import, click on that, and you'll see the little plus symbol come up right next to it. All right, little plus symbol, okay? You can only have one preset for your import preset, develop preset. Okay, later on, if you say, you know what, I'm also, also, I'm always also doing this, whatever this is, all right? You can always come here, find any image, it doesn't matter what image, click on reset, all right? 
go to your import normal, click on it once, and it's going to apply everything. All right, and you say, okay, now I want to, let's say, I want to add a tone adjustment curve. I want a medium contrast curve applied to all my images, okay? We're gonna make that one little change. Okay, so now we need to update. We're gonna go uh, to our uh, import normal, or which is our preset, right? We're gonna right click on it. We're going to update with current settings. And you're gonna to have to tell what the current settings are. All right, now, by chance, we're making the change immediately after I created it. So it remembers everything that I just previously did. If you make your change two, three, five, seven months down the road, it's not gonna remember those things. It's not gonna read what that preset has, all right? So immediately check none, all right? You should be familiar with your preset. We know that it's the highlights, shadows, whites, blacks, texture, clarity, lens correction. And we just added a new one, which is our tone curve. All right. And then all we got to do is come here and hit update. Okay. And that should take care of your preset. Now, if you fail, oh, apply on import. Okay. Uh, make sure you, you check that. All right. If you fail, all right, and you go, uh, I just need to import some images. So let me uh, let me plug in my memory card. It's going to open up my uh, ingest, my import. Okay. Over here on the right hand side, all right, apply during import. Okay. Over. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're right. Uh, right over here on our apply during import. Okay. The first one here, develop settings. Okay. Here are all your choices. All right. I have a bunch that came with Lightroom. All right, here's my user preset. Here's my import normal, but you can see it was already populated because I set that previously. If you forget to set it, you can set it here, okay? Along with that, we have our metadata, which should be your copyright information, all right? And of course, your global keywords, all right? So that should take care of that question. Any okay. any questions okay. with that, Bob? No, I got. All right. I, I refreshed my memory. Yeah, the yeah, last yeah. Last time you did it, I was trying to find the full version that you had before. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, that video covered all the presets, so you didn't. You, yeah. This, yeah, that's fine. Okay. For you Thank new you. people, if you weren't familiar with that, um, it was just we created a, a develop setting um, that you can use for your normal develop process. And we applied it on ingest. So, okay. Any questions? No questions? All right. Uh, thank you uh, again. Oh, wait a minute. Let's switch. Thank you once again for coming out and spending the evening with me. Uh, you know, hopefully you got some um, value from this. All right. Uh, I do appreciate all of you who are my Patreon members. It helps me bring this type of content to you, uh, as well as the Patreon only sessions, which we just recently did. All right. For those of you who are Patreons, uh, who are Patreon members, 
Um, I do want to get the next session uh, started. So if you have a suggestion for what you would like to learn during one of those Patreon sessions, please send me an email. Uh, so I will, you know, uh, put heavy consideration into turning that into our next Patreon session. All right. Uh, and of course, if you're a Patreon member, I usually give uh, either discounts or waive fees during live uh, workshops. So, for example, this workshop coming up with the um, with the models and the flash photography session at the quarry, which I showed you a picture of, uh, it's uh, I will probably end up uh, either reducing the fee or waiving it altogether. Uh, I'll probably reduce it because I, I got to pay the models. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, um, anybody interested in seeing other images from uh, the quarry? From the quarry? Yes. Uh, where is that? I'm trying to figure this, out where that. This is uh, on the back side of Sleeping Giant Mountain. Not not the Albertus Magnus side, but the the other side. So you got to go past Albertus Magnus. Right, uh, the Sleeping Giant Park, uh, as you're coming up from New Haven. All right, Sleeping Giant is going to be on your right hand side. You're going to see the turnoff for Al Albertus or uh, Albertus, no, Quinnipiac College, or no, Albertus right. Magnus, or both. I think they're both like in there. All right, one of those colleges. Uh, so you're going to go past the college. All right, uh, uh, the road kind of uh, borders right along the park and then the next turn takes you to the backside of the park and there's a hiking trail it's called the violet trail Vi violet trail which takes you up to um, the the uh, castle outpost eventually it's like I don't know how many miles but maybe a quarter mile in that path splits all right. So if you take it to the left, it takes you, you know, deep into the woods. If you take it to the right, it takes you to the base of the, the rocks where everybody climbs uh, and the quarries right there. It's it's literally nice, level, easy, wide open, uh, quarter of a mile in. We can very easily bring our, our gear in and on wagons and it's right there. So when you first walk in, uh, when you first walk in, this is the scene you are greeted with. That's that's the scene you're greeted with. Okay. And the um, there is a set of kind of like rude stairs. Oops. Kind of rude stairs that are like right here that wind up and and goes to the other path that goes up the uh up the mountain okay all right and then let's see here's a a close-up that's a close-up of of the ruins i have no clue what this is all i can think of is maybe these were two bays where trucks you know, kind of went in and got loaded. That's all I can figure, you know. Uh, and uh, here's taken in between. Uh, some kids probably propped, made these little um, monument things. Uh, they're just pieces of log with rocks stacked on top. And they put them, you know, there's, there's like four or five. I think it's like four of these archways and each archway had one of these built into it. And so I just kind of positioned myself to, to take it. Um, I don't know if uh, any of you know this gentleman, Greg. Um, he's, he's uh, well, he was of late in the, I think North Haven camera club. All right. He and I checked it out. He's the one that showed me this place, actually. 
you know. So can you know just picture models in like fancy outfits, you know, flowing dresses photographed against this backdrop. That is so cool, you know. Uh, here's uh, another view. Oops. Here's another view. All right. One, two, three, four, five, five. How would light is sunset? I'm sorry, what? The lighting is sunset. How would that be? You know what? I actually was wondering that myself. Let me go to this image. Okay. The sun rises. Uh, let's see. Let me draw. All right. The sun rises here and travels across this way here. All right. So I was obviously high noon. We're going to get straight down. All right? right. But early morning, the light comes in this way. So it puts this side of all the columns and this part here in shadow, okay? However, later in the day, as the sun is more on this side, okay, the sunlight is coming this way, all right? And obviously, the further we go, uh, the trees that are on this side of the, uh, of the clearing, um, tend to block a lot of that light. So I th I'm thinking anything after like two o'clock, three o'clock uh, might be good. I'm going to have to check it against, you know, um, one of those uh, uh, sun tracking apps. Okay. Uh, so I'm thinking later in the day uh, as opposed to early morning because early morning, you know, a lot of people aren't early morning people. But uh, I think it's going to be too much shadow uh, for what we want to do. I'd rather have the light coming in to all the open areas, especially up here. All right. So that's that's my educated guess. Sounds good. Let's see. And then here's another. Here's another shot. This one I processed. So I, I try to bring some of that sky back. It looks kind of fake, but that's the sky that was there. All right. But yeah, imagine, you know, uh, uh, taking your exposure, your, your ambient exposure and dropping it down and then just lighting the model with a single flash in, in the middle of these two columns. That would be an awesome composition, you know. Put put uh, put a model in here. Oh, what are? Oops, wrong one. Put a model right here. I think my orange is not sticking out too too well on here, but. Put a model right there, lit with uh, with your strobe, so that you're lighting the model and not, you know, and and not really the uh, the cement around her. I think that'd make a very pretty photograph. Okay. Uh, let's see. Slightly different angle. Look at that. You know. Put a model anywhere in this scene. How awesome is that? Okay. And then uh, here's another one. Okay. So right here, just, just to the left side of that big hunk of cement um, is a, a crude set of stairs that go up to uh, where I assume the main part of the building used to reside up here. Okay. And uh, it's accessible. Let me see if I can put, oh, here it is. All right. Put a model anywhere in here. 
How awesome is that? You know, I have no clue what any of these structures may have been used for, but uh, this is all that remains. And let's go. The, 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 the trail continues behind this here. And you can see right here uh, in, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, it messes up with my, there we go. Right here is that upper trail. You can see just a little bit of it peeking through the, uh, the trees. All right, so there's a stairs that cuts between the two. You know, so it's just, it's really, it is a very magical location, you know, in my opinion. Oh, that's, oh, I was showing the, uh, Greg, uh, the difference between focusing on foreground, focusing, I was teaching them hyperfocal uh, focusing. So anyway. All right, so that's that's pretty much it. Uh, so hopefully you guys uh, who are local will come on and join us. All right. Anyway, that's it for tonight. Uh, enough chit-chatting. I'll let you all go. Thank you. Uh, next yeah. week is uh, Photoshop. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I'll probably figure it out the day of. <laughs> but uh, again, if anybody's got any any questions, you know, just send it to me, and I'm more than happy to build something around it. Okay. Uh, Dr. Moore, one quick one. Um, there was a uh, supposed to be a meetup last Friday. It was it canceled. Uh oh, with uh, Milford Photo. Right. Yeah. Were you were, in it? were you were you doing that one? No, I was just going to attend. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. I saw your name on there. I thought you might be doing it. Yeah. No. Um, I don't have anything scheduled just yet. Uh, like I said, I, I talked to Jesse about doing the Spider-Man thing. I just got to find a location that's going to be appropriate for it. Uh, and then we'll set that up. Okay. okay. Awesome. All right. All right, guys. Thank you once again. Uh, I really appreciate it. And we'll see you all next week. See you next week. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you for watching Learning Photography with Duck. Brought to you in association with Milford Photo, your local full-service camera store. Located in downtown Milford, Connecticut, Milford Photo offers you a personalized shopping experience. From the latest camera gear to printing and framing services. And, of course, educational workshops to teach you the finer aspects of photography. Don't forget to tell them Duck sent you.